Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace. So glad you could join us here online. We hope you are enjoying the beautiful summer weather and uh, this uh, long weekend coming up. Uh, a few announcements uh, before we get to the, to the word this morning. First is that we are hosting a barbecue August 7th outside, so it'll be a whole outdoor service. And uh, so what that means is we are inviting you to prepare yourself by bringing lawn chairs or blankets for your kids. There's a big grassy area. There's actually a, a sand pit, a volleyball court that the kids can play in during uh, any, any part of the service. And of course, there's the pond, which I know there'll be a thousand kids at. But uh, we want you to know, bring your chairs. And then as well, we're, we're going to provide all the, the, the burgers and hot dogs and some gluten-free options. But then we're asking that you bring uh, with you either a salad or dessert. And what we'll do is when you get here in the morning, we'll be serving coffee out uh, about the barbecue down the hill. And we'll invite you just to bring any desserts or uh, food that you have inside the church. There'll be a couple tables set up for you there. That way we can keep, it all, keep the flies away and then we'll bring it all down after the service, which will be shorter. And then we'll have a, a barbecue together and hang out. So it's gonna be a, a more of a social Sunday. And the week following, we're gonna do another outdoor Sunday, August 14th as well. Uh, we're just not gonna have a whole uh, we're not going to do all the burgers and sausages. We're just going to ask you uh, to, br to bring any food that you'd like and, uh, and we can hang out and have a picnic afterwards and play, uh, have some games and stuff. So invite you to, to do that. If you've been checking out Grace Online and you'd like to uh, join us, it'd be a great Sunday to come because uh, we'll all be outside hanging out. Uh, secondly, uh, Jackie Jimenez is moving in Guelph August 6th. And so if you are able to, there's more information about that in the e-bulletin. You can talk to Tony or Megan, get a hold of them and ask how you can help. So I know they'll be moving August 6th. <clears throat> and as well, if you have been following us online, you can go to our website, igrace.ca, and there's a tab there. Uh, if you're a first time uh, washer or listener or you wanna connect, uh, there's a connect card there. We love to hear from you, get a chance to say hello. So hope you're doing well and uh, are, in, are, are enjoying uh, connecting here online. We want to give one big massive thank you to everyone who helped out with VBS. I know last week we had a replay week and I just wanted to make sure that everybody who was helping out knew. We had uh, uh, 70 plus kids here uh, through the whole week. We had an amazing time, lots of fun, and I know uh, it was really impactful. And so we're just so thankful for the ability to do that and thank all our volunteers and it wouldn't happen without you and especially uh, to Lindsay who just works tirelessly on it. All right, with all that said, I think it's time to pray and we'll open up the word together. So let's do that. Jesus, this morning, uh, we are ready and longing to connect to you, Lord. We're longing, Lord, for you to teach us your ways, to teach us, Lord, how to live as your people, Lord, your sons and daughters in this world, how to live as lights and how to remain in faith in the midst of uh, temptations and trials. Lord, we know life is not easy. And Lord, we're looking and longing for, for fresh bread this morning. And so we ask as we open your word and as we consider your thoughts, God, that you would impress them, Holy Spirit, and do your work in our lives. So we submit this morning and our time together to you and ask the Holy Spirit to come and have your, have your way, Lord. In your name, Jesus, amen. Great. Well, this morning, uh, I know we've, I've been off for a couple weeks, uh, had some vacation time, uh, had, a, had a great time away, uh, but uh, back in the Psalms this morning, and we will be for the rest of the summer, and um, <clears throat> we're going to spend our time looking at the powerful message of Psalm 99. Uh, whenever we look at a Psalm, <clears throat> what we're really after is to understand how Psalms teach us how to pray. Because these psalms that we're going to read, that Psalm 99 or any of the psalms we've read, they aren't just for that day. I mean, they are, but they're for more than that day because we study them so that they can become tools for us in prayer. They're meant to be tools in our tool belt for the day of trouble. And that's the way you see Jesus talking about the Lord's Prayer, is he gave them a prayer so that they could use it as a tool to connect to God. And that's what he said, pray like this then. And because Jesus understood that, I mean, it's an old phrase, but 
If you teach a man, or if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach a man to fish, he'll never be hungry. And the Psalms and the way we'll learn to pray because of them work just like that. They're teaching us how to pray. They're tools in our hands to help connect our, our hearts to God's heart. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, how many of you have found that to be true? That in the day of trouble, when you're looking for something to pray, or you have a need, it's the Psalms actually that are there for you. And uh, we had a prayer meeting the other week for Naomi, who's actually doing uh, much better. We were praying for her, and I was just, it was just cool watching, because in those moments, as you're crying out to God, the Psalms are the, are the prayers of the saints, and the, the Psalms become words of faith or trust when you don't have words of faith or trust, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Psalms become words that express and give voice to our pain and our frustration when we don't have words to express or give voice to our pain and frustration, right? How long, O oh Lord? And the words of the Psalms also become paths of wisdom that lead us back into trust and truth when we lose our way. And Psalm 99 is no different. So I know, I'm not sure who's watching, obviously, but I, and I'm sure maybe this is the wrong crowd. Maybe you've been uh, out of the dating scene for years, but I thought it would be fun to play out my introduction for Psalm 99 as though we're setting up like a, a blind date. That everybody who's listening is coming on a blind date. And it is kind of true, I think, because everybody who tuned in this morning, who's here live, they came this morning not knowing which psalm they were going to meet. But your best friend Mike has told you, trust me, wait until you meet Psalm 99. I know you're, <laughs> you're all trying to remember now if you can remember Psalm 99. And I'm just wondering anyone, if offhand you remember Psalm 99, if it comes to mind. And if you haven't, let me tell you this morning, Psalm 99 is really incredible. You have to meet each other, and you're going to be perfect for one another when you meet. But maybe this morning you're a little bit nervous about blind dates. I mean, everybody is. Usually, maybe you like to get to know Psalms in a group before you go on a date. Maybe you're a bit insecure about yourself. Maybe you haven't dated a Psalm in a while. What if it gets awkward? What if the Psalm is out of your league? But Maybe you're trying not to get your hopes up too because you're, you're thinking maybe, maybe this psalm could change me or help me. And maybe the question you're really asking is, if Psalm 99 is so great, Mike, why haven't I heard of it? Why can't I call it to mind? It's not Psalm 23 or 103 or 91. Why is this psalm still available? Well, let me warn you. Psalm 99 isn't the scripture blind date that you probably thought you wanted this morning. But it's certainly the one that you need. All of us need Psalm 99 in our lives. In fact, I would go so far to say this morning that if you want to have a beautiful, meaningful, life-giving, faith-filled relationship with God like you've longed for, if you want to enter into trust, if you want to worship wholeheartedly, if you want to obey God completely, the key to all of those things exists within Psalm 99. We need Psalm 99 more than any of us realize and what, it, what its message is. So I know it's a blind date, but I want us to read the psalm together and I want you to consider how Psalm 99 might be a key for us in our relationship with God. How Psalm 99 might help us pray. And I want us to look specifically for what this psalm insists we know about God and what it insists we do because of that. So let's read it together. <clears throat> There's no ascription to Psalm 99. It just simply reads, The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. 
Samuel was also those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them, and they kept his testimonies and the, stat- and the statues that he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy. All right, now that you have uh, met Psalm 99, I think it'd be it's a good time for us to leave the blinded analogy behind because I think we're ready to break open this psalm because it promises, and, and I think it promises us that it has the key to help us unlock deeper trust with God. Does anybody want deeper trust with God? It, it, it promises that we can tap into the ability to obey where we may have struggled to before. Does anybody have an area in your life where you've struggled to really obey God? Or maybe, or also it promises to renew a spirit of worship and adoration within us. And the question I wanted to ask was, does anyone feel stale in their worship or their adoration or their vibrancy with God? Is there a key that exists to unlock these things in our lives? And if so, how could we integrate that in our prayer and communion with God? Well, I'll start by saying that when you read the psalm, I don't think the key is very, very hidden. <clears throat> you probably noticed it. And if you didn't, the key is declared three times to you, repeated as you go through the psalm. As you walk through it, it tells you about God. The Lord reigns. Let his people tremble. He sits enthroned on the cherubims. Let the earth quake. He's great in Zion. And then it says, holy is he. It keeps going and it talks again about God executing justice and and people exalting and falling on their face before him in worship. And it says, holy is he. And then finally it says that God was listening to those and speaking to Moses and Aaron and Samuel. And when they called on him, he answered. And in all of this, they say, it's time for us to exalt the Lord our God, to worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. The key of the psalm is is that it has a message to us about the importance of the holiness of God. But not just abstractly knowing that God is holy, but rather experiencing the life-shaking reality that happens when someone beholds the holy God of heaven as he is, enthroned on a flaming chariot of four-faced creatures, riding high over all of creation as he rules over it and enacts justice and establishes equity. It's essentially the same thing that happened to Abraham and Moses and Samuel and Isaiah and Ezekiel and John and obviously to the writer of this psalm. They were all people who didn't just know about the holiness of God, but people who had an encounter with God in his holy temple, in his holy hill, seated enthroned. And they they tell us about these things in Scripture, and I'm not going to quote all the places that that it happens, but over and over again, there's this picture of the throne room of God and people gazing upon it and being changed, never being the same. And I want to suggest to us this morning that 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 same encounter is something that we were meant to have as well. Psalm 99 is actually about us knowing or calling us to enter into that. And the point of the psalm is to encourage us that that experience of seeing and being changed and transformed as we view the the grandeur of God is not far off and it's not impossible or inaccessible for any of us. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're an elder, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a lawyer, or if you're a stay-at-home mom. You were meant to behold the glory and the holiness of God. It's not just for ancient prophets either. In fact, that experience is exactly why Psalm 99 exists. To proclaim boldly 
to us all the things that we were made to see. You were made to see into the throne, of, throne room of God and understand about God things that we have only yet glimpsed or heard echoes of. See, Psalm 99 is there to give us a foretaste of what's really happening, of what's, what's real, that leaves us longing and thirsting and hungering for more. It's not just a, a made-up scene, but something that actually exists that's playing out even right now as we speak. God is enthroned in the heavens. The elders and the living creatures are falling down on their face and declaring holy, holy before him. All the saints of God. And it's our call to live and be aware of that reality. You were created to live in the wonder and the awe of God's holiness. And your heart was meant to be captivated by it. And without it, without it, it's actually hard to live the Christian life. So Psalm 99 comes to show us the truth about what really lies at the center of everything. What's really at the center of our lives, at the center of all of this world that's happening, the galaxies. What's at the center of it? What upholds all of it? And Psalm 99 is there to tell us, if we seek after it, it's, it's, it's to put a taste on our lips, that this is something that you could find out, that you could seek out. And if we find it, what we'll find is that there's not some absent landlord there behind the curtain in, the, in, in Oz, not some deterministic robot, not some petty, ruthless tyrant, but the Lord of all, seated on his throne, full of justice, and yet inclined towards those who call upon his name. This is a picture that Psalm 99 is wanting to impress upon our hearts. Psalm 99 exists to take us beyond the veil of what we only see with our eyes and call us to, <coughs> to prepare to gaze beyond into the glorious weight and power of God's presence as he dwells in his temple in Zion. To behold the beauty of his holiness and there to tremble before God, to fear him, to worship, and to be transformed. It's the same throne room that you see here in the Psalms that, that Isaiah sees as he, as he sees the temple and the train of his robe filling the temple and the, and the smoke and the angels crying holy. It's the same thing that Ezekiel sees when he sees the, the flaming wheels and the angels and the cherubim and the seraphim. It's the same thing John sees. They all saw it. And we were made to see it. We were made to behold God in his holiness. Now, I should take a moment to define what I mean when I say the word holy or holiness. As the actual meaning for the word, for some reason to us, it's just, it's overused maybe, it's rote, it's, it's repeated, and it's become sort of unclear what it actually means. And sometimes it can even become warped. There's a, sort of an unhelpful version of the word holy. By definition, to gaze upon the holiness of God refers to beholding God as he truly is. Incomparable. Holy means incomparable, completely or utterly unique, or unlike any other. Not common or ordinary in any way. The word for, for holy come, is the, word, the Hebrew word kadosh, which refers to something or someone who has divine qualities as opposed to human ones. And that's what Psalm 99 wants us to discover, that there's a being, there's an ultimate being, God, who lives unconstrained, eternal, limitless, almighty, and utterly good. Literally, kadosh, if you were saying it in Hebrew, it would, it would mean to be cut off or separate, or separate. But not maybe in the way you think. See, God's holiness and sometimes the way we think about holiness does not refer to him needing to be separated from other things in terms of distance or space for the sake of purity. Holiness doesn't need to be separate in order to stay clean. Remember, Satan is pictured in the heavenly courts in Job 
And Jesus walked on the earth with all sorts of sinners, and both God and Jesus are holy, and both Satan and, of course, the people of you know, the first century were, 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 were sin, full of sin, and yet those two things were together. So holiness is not about separateness and distance. And so when the psalmist uses the word holy or kadosh, he does not imply a sense of God being far away from us or, or needing to be separated from us for fear of being defiled. God doesn't need to be aloof or self-righteous. God isn't condescending. But rather, God's holiness simply refers to the fact that he is separated from us by his very essence. He can be close to us, just different. He's uncreated and we're, we're created. So for instance, if you think about a fruit bowl and in a fruit bowl there's an apple and an orange. They differ in essence, but they can both live, they both live in the fruit bowl. They're holy and separate from one another in terms of their essence, but they're right beside each other. And so to, to understand the holiness of God, it means that God is just different and other than who we are. He's not comparable to us by degree or measure. Likewise, even though we're made in his image, we must remember that we're not, we're not the same as God. That's actually what idolatry is, is to, to project onto things and people the attributes of God. And that God's holiness affects all of who he is. So the fact that God's different means every part of God is holy. Every attribute in all of his nature is holy. So for example, God loves and we love but those loves are not the same because God's love is holy. So it's not correct to compare our loves. They are not the same thing. Our love is bound by finiteness, but his love is holy and eternal and unconstrained by anything. So let me ask you this morning, who, by way of experience, some personal experience, understands even maybe a little the, the impact of having encountered the holiness of God. Who, who might say, I, I've had that kind of experience in my life of meeting God who is wholly other than you, who draws right near to you, but yet is not like you. Have you ever had that experience? I think that's the kind of experience people had with Jesus. It, he was like them and yet not like them. He was holy. And what happens, do you think, when when created beings that are finite connect in some way with, <laughs> with, with the infinite one? The answer is, I think, that you can hardly contain that reaction. You can hardly contain it. And if you do, it leaves you trembling. You can't hold it in. And the psalm, that's where it begins. It goes right there in verse 1. It says, when you see the Lord reigning and enthroned, the people tremble. When, you, when you're aware of God as he is, as he truly is, it leaves us trembling. Everything within us, I think, begins to resonate. Everything within you just starts responding to God. If you want to, uh, to get a base, maybe you haven't had an experience like that. You're, you're not familiar or haven't felt like you've maybe really touched the otherness of God. Maybe you want a more basic and non-spiritual analogy. Well, I'll give you one. How many you of you as guys remember the first time you realized that girls weren't like you? Maybe you were 11 or 12 or 13, and you were, <laughs> you were suddenly one thing, and you realized they were incredibly and wonderfully another. Who remembers the almost tangible tension when those two unlike things got close? The shakiness that came over you when maybe you saw that first crush walk in the room. The flip-flopping stomach. Otherness does that. And if you can relate to that, then you can imagine the effect on people when they don't just encounter the opposite sex, but they encounter complete otherness in terms of God's divine holiness. When every level of their being is responding to God's holy authority and holy power. See, you may have only ever known in your life, you know, some sort of earthly authority or power, governments, police, maybe the army. 
But now imagine, or maybe even someone really wealthy or powerful or someone at, at, your, at, your, at your job or, 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 or a celebrity even. But then can you imagine you perceive all of, all of that power times infinity in one moment on a global and universal level. You become aware that there's a power that exists like that. There's someone who stands unmoved at the center, unshaken, in control, not lacking anything, reigning supreme. And then not only that, but you imagine that that omnipotent person, all-powerful, is coming and drawing down, kneeling down, seeking out to find you. There's a beautiful song out right now called Omnipotent and Intimate. And when you hear it, what the songwriter is doing is contrasting these two extremes that are brought together in perfect complement in God's divine nature. Omnipotence, all-powerful, all the authority, and yet tender and intimate. And to think about those two things existing together in one person is hard to imagine, but that's what holiness is all about. In our, in our human minds, we can't comprehend those two things being together, and yet we find in God them joined in perfect harmony. What seems incomparable and unique exists in God. And when you experience that, it affects you. It affects you to, to touch the, the, the all-powerful God and yet realize that he's loving and gracious. It affects you. I imagine it, it, it affects you physically that there's some sort of healthy combination of fear and trembling and awe and that's understandable because it says even the earth responds. It says, I know verse two, it says, the Lord's great in Zion, he's exalted. Oh, sorry, the Lord sits enthroned on the cherubim. Let the earth quake. And the thing is, when you catch a glimpse that God is the great king and know in your depths that there is no one else like that, that he's the ultimate one, that he sits enthroned upon the cherubim as a ruler who holds authority. And this is what the psalm is showing us over all nations of the earth, who sits enthroned over all of the, 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 the rulers and powers and principalities and dominions, both good and evil, over all of the natural world and its elements, over all the people of God. If you were to to see that, it makes it really hard to get afraid or be fearful about other things, doesn't it? All your fear gets suddenly directed towards God. God's like a vacuum. All of your longings and needs, when you see the great king, all of them become aimed at him. This is what holiness does. It, it sets everything in per, proper proportion and perspective in our lives. Imagine being in the presence of that kind of power and love. Why would you go anywhere else or fear any other thing? Verse 5 rightly says, having even a sense of that will send even the strongest falling to their face in worship. Exalt the Lord, worship, which means on your face at his footstool. Holy is he. And what does it do when we, when we see that? It leaves us shaking, trembling, vibrating with all the power and energy of having drawn near to the goodness of God. And that's the way that holiness works for us. That's why we need it. That's why we need Psalm 99. Is it's trying to connect us to this great God, to his grandeur, to his holiness, to make our hearts open to it because we're so prone to, to minimize God. We're so prone to make him smaller than he is. But when you see God, not just as regular authority or power, but as wholly absolute, unmistakably different, with a kind of power that's fused and animated by love, what you feared before is thoroughly put in perspective by holiness. Some of us need holiness more than we realize. Some of the problems in our life require holiness, a vision of God. Some of us were worried about tomorrow, about getting what you thought you deserved at work or in your marriage. 
But then you saw God as he is high and lifted up, riding on a flame-throwing throne chariot of, made of four frightening animal-faced throne guardians and God dispensing justice and equity without partiality. And you look at that and you say, well, okay, I surrender to you. And then not only is God a lover of justice, but you find he's working on your behalf, attentively, attentively listening to your call. That's the contrast of the whole second half of the psalm, that a holy God meets and listens and responds to people. We find, in fact, that God, that great God is also eager to answer us, longing to guide and direct us. Moses and Aaron, it says in verse 6, were among his priests. Samuel was also those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. Now, that kind of encounter with God's holiness puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? See, Psalm 99 calls us to practice gazing on the throne of God. This is something that you can practice that I would say actually should be the goal of, of every prayer meeting, is to come to the place of reverence and awe before God. And as you do that, here's the promise. It gives that conditional promise to you is that if you want to grow in that trust, if you want to walk in fresh obedience and have a renewed encounter in worship, you can. But it will only happen to the extent that you regard and revere God as holy in your life. Remember, revering God is not just saying the words, you're holy, but pursuing an encounter by opening your heart, by gazing and thinking and meditating and worshiping at the foot of God. Do you know that your ability to grow in trust, obedience, and worship is inextricably tied to your awareness and reverence of the holiness of God? The deeper that you grasp God's holiness, the greater you'll trust. The more profound your worship will be, the deeper the obedience will be. We often run into areas of our lives where trust seems impossible. Where we, where we say, I be, you know, maybe not externally, but we, we have this thought in our hearts, I believe you, God, for a lot of things, but there's still this one area that I, that I cannot believe. We have places like of obedience that seem insurmountable. We've been struggling to overcome or work through. We have things in our, in most of our, you know, some things in order, but I don't know how to control or master these areas of my life, God. I haven't said yes, I'm still living in fear or shame. And some of us have worship where we've, it's been years and we feel stale and lifeless. And we just think in our hearts, I just don't engage God that way anymore. You know, I'm not, I'm not really as vibrant as I used to be. And because most of us are aware of these shortcomings, we certainly try to expand our self-effort in order to change, don't we? We say, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work harder at that all the while not realizing that Psalm 99 is telling us that what we really need to do is just expand our vision, is to become and set ourselves in reverence before God. Think about this for a moment. What if the problems that plagued all of your efforts to worship and trust and obey God more could actually be dealt with if you addressed your reverence and awe of God? So when I say that, I think we need to ask, what does it then mean to actually revere God? Well, the answer is that it means that we must learn to hallow or make God holy in our lives. Hallow means just that. It means to make or treat something as holy. Now, we know, of course, we can't, none of us can make God holy, any more holy than he already is. And so that's not what it means. But we can treat God or not treat God as holy. We can have a, an openness or a connection to the holiness of God, or we can't. And that means we have a choice then to hallow or make holy or treat God as holy and his name is holy, or we don't. And that's why Jesus puts it in the Lord's Prayer. It's the second line. He commands us to pray, hallowed be your name. Now when we pray that, contrary to what most people think, it's not a declaration to God saying, our Father in heaven, Holy is your name. That is actually not a helpful way to pray the prayer. 
Rather, it's, so it's not a declaration, God, you're holy, which is fine to say. What it's actually teaching us is to pray a petition or a heart cry to say, our Father in heaven, let your name be hallowed in my heart or in my life for the sake of the world. Right? Our Father in heaven, let your name be hallowed or let me, let me make your name great. Let me live captured by a vision of holiness. Let holiness inform all of my thinking. That's why Jesus teaches us at the, at the, right at the start of the prayer the importance of having a heart flooded with the vision of the holiness of God. I'm convinced this is in many ways the most vital part of the prayer meeting that we most often skip. Most important part of devotions is we come to the Father and we ask him to show us his holiness, for his holiness to define our thinking and our hearts and our perspective. Now the whole first half of the psalm, and we've started to break into the second and, and we'll wrap with this, but it sets up this image of God as the king, the one who reigns enthroned, exalted, praised, who loves justice and punishes evil. But the whole second half, verse six onward, not in contrast, but in harmony, fills out that picture of that king as someone who is defined by hearing those who call on, upon him, as a king who answers those who cry out to him, as a king who forgives them when they're disloyal servants and forgives them. That's why it mentions Moses and Samuel, because they were those who understood that God wasn't just a ruler, but a gracious king who wanted to lead his people. And I want us to look at that because there's this last verse or second last verse in, in verse 8 where it puts together, just as before, omnipotent and intimate, it puts together two seemingly competing ideas. It says in verse 8, O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. And so it says God is forgiving but an avenger of their wrongdoings. And what it's saying there is problematic from our vantage point, isn't it? Because how could God both forgive someone and yet avenge them, their wrongdoings or punish their wrongdoings? How could someone be pardoned and held accountable? How could God be both merciful and just to people in light of their sinfulness? This is what it's saying. The king who sits enthroned in heaven is, is, is a forgiving God, but also an avenger of wrongdoings. How could, how, could God, how could God be like that? How could God do that? And the answer, of course, is impossible from our vantage point. In, in, our, in our minds, we can't comprehend how, how mercy and justice could be mingled. And yet, they can be. And the reason that they can be is because God is holy. He's not like us. Only a holy God could hold such, such, such different things together. In fact, that's what the cross is all about. It's a platform or a frame that displays the beauty of the holiness of God. It's God's masterpiece on the cross. There on the cross, the justice of God is satisfied and the mercy of God is poured out. The wrath of God is taken care of and the grace of God come together. And all of that then leads us to this picture of the king on the throne as the one who's merciful and gracious. And that's exactly what we see in Revelation 4 and 5 where John is taken into the heavenly throne room. And, and the picture, it's almost... Revelation 4 and 5 is really like, a, like an updated version of Psalm 99. Because there, what do we see? That all the same things exist. They come into a great throne room. The king there sits enthroned. All of the people around are crying, holy, holy, holy. The cherubim are there. The, or as, as some people refer to them, the four living creatures. Because that's how the, the cherubim are, are, are explained in Ezekiel 1 and 10. And all the people and the elders are falling down just as they are in Psalm 99 and they're worshiping. 
And they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But they're on the throne. Here is a king who dispenses justice and forgives. And yet, in Revelation 4 and 5, the picture stands complete. Because there it says on the throne, the Holy One reigns, not as a lion, but as a lamb that was slain. And this is the picture for us, is the holiness of God in the face of Christ. And so I just want to pray for us this morning. I want, to, I want us to, to, to know that, that if you're struggling to trust God, if you're struggling to obey God, if worship feels stale, it's only because you haven't glimpsed or comprehended all of the holiness of God. And if you do, you'd be just like those creatures, just like those elders, just like the psalmist. You'd fall on your face, you'd cry holy, and you'd know that the Lord is able to hear your, your cry. So let's pray. Father, this morning in this place, we revere you. We honor you. We thank you that you are the great king and you rule over every power and authority. You rule with gracious justice. You rule and you reign. And Lord, we come before you humbly and ask God for you to unveil, to, to show us the glory of God, to show us the splendor and the grandeur of who you are. Lord, we ask God that you would, you would show us your son. You'd show us that throne room. You'd show us Jesus. And then as we behold him, the glory of God in the face of Christ, that the light of God, that the healing power, the strength and the wisdom and the grace of God would come upon your people. We ask God that you would humble us this morning, that you would shake our hearts with reverent fear and that we would never be the same. We ask all these things, God, in your mighty name.